Hi, this is J.D. Ingram of the Charleston Pipe Band, and I want to welcome you to my series on how to be a great piper in three steps. As a refresher, here is the tree diagram for our three easy steps. Stay tuned as we dive into today's topic. Step two, have rhythmic embellishment steps, because that's how we add interest and rhythm to our music. So why is it so important that our embellishments are rhythmic? Well, the steps of an embellishment take up actual space within the larger framework of the music, and so they must be played quickly and steadily and cleanly, but also rhythmically, so that they add to the music instead of distracting from it. The skills we're going to work on today are playing small but audible embellishment steps, playing even embellishment steps, and focusing on not winding up or pausing on either end of our embellishments. The drills are breaking down our embellishments to their component steps and practicing them slowly and evenly, and also using a metronome to bring them back up to speed while maintaining clean, even rhythms. All right, so by now hopefully you have learned all, or at least most of the possible embellishments on the bagpipes, and you know at least academically, where they go in relation to the music. We know that uh, embellishments like doublings and uh, whatever you call the tripling, hornpipe shake, uh, shiver, pele movement, those are going to start on the beat. Uh, embellishments that are focused around a theme note will start on the beat, typically. And embellishments like the twirlewet and grip will end on the beat. In both cases, the placement to the beat is kind of the first thing that I would work on. So with all of the doubling type, 99% of them are going to start with a G grace note. So practicing in context, placing that G grace note on the beat. Uh, I'm going to get my handy dandy metronome out here, playing at 80 beats a minute right now. And if I was going to do A, B, C doubling, start with just getting that G grace note right on the click, and then I would add the second grace note. And if I was going to do a Pele, right, um, anything like that. Practicing, finding spots in your music where you're playing one of those embellishments and then practicing putting it in context, breaking it down to just the simplest thing, which in the case of a doubling or a tripling is that G grace note, and then adding pieces as you go. With your grips and twirlewas, I the simplest thing that I do is replace it with a short low G that ends on the beat. So same thing, um, A, B, now we're going to do grip to C. Placing the grip with just that low G sound and making sure that I'm ending on the beat, coming up to that C. So that C is still hitting on the click, right? With the C doubling, the first C hits on the click. With the grip, that first C hits on the click. Now I add to it a B grip to C. grace note in the middle of my placeholder low G. Um, and then I can update that going back down the scale to a uh, grip. And then I can up upgrade that to a full on twirlua. ring finger, um, grace note to that ending note, or, or low A, but still hitting right on the click. Um, the main exception to either starting or ending on the beat, in my opinion, and this is my opinion, I'm sure there's plenty of debate out there, is the D throw. 
There are different ways to play the D throw. You can do the light D throw. Um, or you can do the heavy D throw. Right? Which is basically a grip followed by a C and a D. It is my opinion that the D, grace note or, or uh, however you're playing it, is where the beat falls. So that low G is before the beat and the C, the, the, low, the second low G or the C comes after the beat. So when I'm practicing that, I do a placeholder low G first, A to D throw. <laughs> a placeholder low G and a placeholder C. And then I add the D grace note if I'm playing a light D drop. Right, and so if you've uh, been told that your D drows or your grips or your doublings or whatever is crushed or not rhythmic or occurring at the wrong time in relation to the beat, find the tune that you're practicing, find the problematic embellishment, zoom in on the two or three notes around it and practice that, breaking it down into component steps. Um, and uh, then we've also talked about starting slow and going fast. So if I have been told that I've got a problematic D throw. Um, maybe I start at 60 beats a minute. Make sure that's hitting right on the beat. And then and if I was doing a heavy D throw. two steps after the beat instead of one. Uh, and then you would up it. Typically I like to go somewhere between three and five beats a minute. So the next practice would be. And then 70 beats a minute. And then 75 beats a minute. And on each of these, I would stop and do it at least three times, ideally three times in a row correctly, uh, maybe five or ten times. Set yourself a rule up front and hold yourself to it. Don't, don't cheat yourself, because the only person who loses there is you. So here's 75. And then 80. Until you find that you're starting to have trouble with it. These are basically, I'm clicking it at double time, so when I was doing it at 80, that's really kind of the equivalent of how you play a D throw at 40 beats a minute. Now I'm up to 160, so this is the equivalent uh, of a 4-4 uh, played at 80 beats a minute. beats a minute all the way up to there, that should feel no problem, right? 200, see what happens. I'm still feeling it. See 200, no. That's as far as my metronome goes. So, um, take it all the way up as fast as you can play it comfortably. And then a good habit is 
as soon as it starts to get to the point where it's really difficult for you to get more than one or two in a row correctly, you can't get three in a row, bring it back down a notch. Down, you know, if, if 200 was where I started having trouble, bring it back down to 195, then back down to 190. And practice that control. Now that I've like tensed myself up and I'm playing super fast, playing it slowly on purpose can really help um, control and bring it back into context. Because if I'm practicing this for say competition march, ideally your competition march is played uh, somewhere between, ideally no lower than 60 beats a minute, maybe 70 beats a minute, certainly not as high as 80 beats a minute, uh, unless you're playing something that's far too easy for you most. So low bagpipe competition marches, kind of in the mid to high 60s. Uh, so if you can get it down clean at 75, 80, and then you bring it back down to 65, that should feel easy, smooth, right, under control, which is what you're going for, is to coming across as uh, having complete control of your fingers and your bagpipe. So that's kind of the general layout of the exercises. Let's look at some uh, sheet music notation for it and uh, walk you through it real quick and send you on your way. Here's the sheet music outlining these drills. Notice I start with D throws, then go on to burls, grips, and twirluths. You could also extend these out on your own by including doublings and other embellishments similar to doublings, replacing them with just a G grace note at first, and then the full embellishment second. All right, so you've got that sheet music. Go back, print it out, um, screenshot it, or reach out to me directly if you want a copy of it. And uh, walking through it, we've got D throws. So we talked about that before, where you've got the placeholder low G first. And then you've got the placeholder low G and C. And then the full D throw. And that's the light D throw. Uh, and then I wrote it out as a proper D throw. And then I did the same thing for the heavy D throw. act like uh, doublings, so the first tap comes on the beat, right, um, working your way up. If it's a grace noted burl or a, a double burl, single combination of notes all the way down the page that's the bulk of the page is every single combination of notes that I've seen a grip played which is basically any low hand note to the same low hand note or a higher low hand note except for D because you probably put a D throw in um, and basically any note to any of the high hand notes so <laughs> Um, and then the bottom line is tour, bottom two lines is tour Lewis. Right. Um, and tour Lewis are typically any note to a low A or low A to low A, B to B, C to C. All right, kind of your options there and work our way through all those. So that is the sheet music. Looking at this, um, finding which embellishment you're having trouble with zooming in on that line. I didn't write out the doublings because that's basically just replace it with a G grace note first and then place and then put the doubling back in. You don't have to understand where that placeholder falls, um, but your uh, placeholder, the, the rhythm of the doubling should be about the same as the rhythm of a grip. So if I'm playing a march or a uh, Scott and the Braves is a great example. <laughs> worked my Torlua out to that, then my doubling shouldn't be, right? Right, the, the C 
short C in the middle of the doubling should be about the same amount of time as the low G's in the torlo. That's the, uh, what creates consistent and rhythmic steps throughout the idiom, throughout the, the presentation of the tune. And that's not to say they all have to be that open. If you're taking a very aggressive take on Scotland the Brave, you can go. Right? Have real tight, crisp uh, embellishments if you can control that and keep it consistent. If you can't keep it consistent and controlled, take a less aggressive approach. Because consistency and control is the name of the game. It's, it's how you sound like you know what you're doing. Anyways, that's my uh, two cents on having rhythmic embellishments. Work hard and uh, keep up the good work, guys. Thanks. Thanks for watching again this week, guys. As a reminder, we've been discussing of the three steps of being a great bagpiper. Step one, have good finger work. Part two, have good embellishments. And section two of that, which is have rhythmic embellishment steps. Work hard. Take care, guys.